Hi, it's Katrina. Gobekli Tepe. The temple complex of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey is a prehistoric marvel of humanity. This sacred place was constructed 11,500 years ago by hunter-gatherers in what could be the first temple and religious center used by humans anywhere on the planet. To give you an idea of how significant it is, Gobekli Tepe was erected 6,000 years before Stonehenge, and new discoveries at the site are changing the way we view the rise of civilization. The megaliths here were built and arranged by prehistoric people that did not yet have metal tools or even pottery. Thanks to new research, it seems that the ancient humans who built Gobekli Tepe may have been inspired by geometry. Researchers are saying they found proof that the impressive stone structures and the huge limestone pillars were pre-planned before development, which would mean that this could be the very first instance of humans using geometry to build a great structure, as well as the first example of a planned temple complex. There are many pits surrounded by standing stones or pillars arranged in circles. Each circle has a similar layout with two large stone T-shaped pillars with smaller stones facing inward. The tallest pillars are 16 feet high, weighing between 7 and 10 tons. Some carved out sections of rock are called portals, and this unusual double portal has carvings of wild cattle, a boar, and some type of predator. Around the site, some of the stones are plain, while others are full of carvings of all kinds of animals like foxes, lions, scorpions, and birds. There is no evidence of housing or farming in the area, so how were hunter-gatherers able to build something so complex? Researchers used an algorithm based on standard deviation mapping to identify an underlying geometric pattern that regulated the design. Geometry and floor plans are believed to have emerged much later than when Gobekli Tepe was built, after hunter-gatherers became farmers. But this place is proof that architectural planning, abstract design rules, and organizational patterns were already being used before farmers started making their fields into rectangles. Christopher Columbus and Syphilis Archaeologists have made a rather disturbing discovery about the famous explorer Christopher Columbus. As most of us already know, the Italian explorer was the first to venture across the Atlantic Ocean on an official expedition and discover North America for Europe, paving the way for more European explorers and the eventual colonization of the Americas and the utter destruction of its natives. And while a lot of people know that when the first settlers came to America, they brought with them nasty diseases that infected local population, such as smallpox, what a lot of people don't know is that Christopher Columbus and his crew were also blamed for bringing this sexually transmitted infection called syphilis from America back to Europe. That's right, the sharing of diseases was kind of reciprocal. At least that's what historians thought until now. Syphilis devastated Europe beginning in the late 15th century, right around the same time Columbus returned to Europe. It's an easily curable disease now, but for 20 years following Christopher Columbus's return, millions of people were ravaged and killed by syphilis. Archaeologists recently investigated nine skeletons from Finland, Estonia, and the Netherlands that predate Christopher Columbus. They found inside of their bones traces of the bacteria which causes syphilis, suggesting the disease may have already been in Europe and that Christopher Columbus was blamed for no reason at all. Researchers from the University of Zurich are now saying it wasn't Christopher Columbus's fault and that syphilis may have already been in Europe and its outbreak at the time of Columbus returning from his adventure was just a big coincidence. West African Technologies The human species, also known as Homo sapiens, rose out of Africa roughly 300,000 years ago. Then, according to the official narrative, about 40,000 years ago, the Middle Stone Age began. This marked the end of the longest human culture, primitive cave people, and the beginning of the era of technology. 40,000 years ago, humans started making things, all kinds of things. Clothing, tools, storage for water, personal decorations, bows and arrows, you know what I mean. But something that has boggled archaeologists and anthropologists for a long time is just how the Middle Stone Age ended. Meaning, how did we get over the Stone Age and move into the more complex stages of mastering iron and copper? The answer may lie in West Africa. Recent archaeological work in Senegal has led to the discovery of a mysterious site in the north of the country, where the Middle Stone Age ended much more recently than in other parts of the world. The site has been dated back around 12,000 years. 
The people here never developed beyond the Middle Stone Age, which is confusing because most other places were already heavily advanced by this time. Evidence from Senegal suggests climate change could be the reason for the slow evolution. Because this area of West Africa never saw such a harsh change in climate as the Ice Age ended, like other places around the world, it created stability. This stability meant the people didn't have any need to change or evolve. What this suggests is that the only reason humans managed to push their way into the age of technology is that they had to. Necessity is the mother of invention, and as the world changed around them, they had no choice but to evolve and learn to survive. Viking Settlement Archaeologists may have just discovered a Viking settlement in North America. A team of researchers from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, along with several other archaeologists, believe they have found evidence of a second Viking site in the Western Hemisphere. If proved correct, it would be the first Viking settlement found in over 50 years. The discovery was made thanks to satellite image analysis and a handful of preliminary excavations. This happened at Point Rose in Newfoundland, Canada. Oddly enough, the first Viking settlement, which has been proven real for decades, is also located in Newfoundland. The first Viking site is called Las Aumedos. The buildings here date back 1,000 years, way before Christopher Columbus ever arrived to the Caribbean and the British to the east coast of North America. If this newest site is proven legit, it will prove that the Vikings may have actually spread out across Newfoundland, trying to set up some kind of larger, more permanent site. Had they succeeded, Canada may have been heavily populated by Vikings way before anyone else showed up. Richard III A team of researchers from the University of Leicester have made a pretty weird discovery involving King Richard III of England. According to the research team, they discovered a skeleton with battle wounds and an unnatural curvature of the spine in a parking lot. They believe the skeleton is that of the dead monarch. If true, the discovery could rewrite a rather tumultuous period of English history. In the history books, Richard III was a despised king whose body was thrown into a random river after being defeated by Henry Tudor during the War of the Roses. The legend propagated at the time was that his own people disliked him so much that they just tossed him away and forgot about him. But the rumors that he was deformed and evil were propagated by the winners of the day, and the truth is much more likely that the killed king was buried quietly in a church without much fanfare. After digging through many historical records, the location of the lost king's remains were still a mystery. But based on some evidence, researchers decided to dig up a parking lot to look for him, and actually found remains on the property of the Grey Friars Church in Leicester. Much of the older church had been destroyed over the years, and the burials inside had been covered by an empty lot. But underneath were hidden secrets, and all this could mean the king was never tossed into a river at all. Archaeologists are fairly certain the body is his. They still need to do more tests to find out, but all clues point to it being that of Richard III. The fact that he was given a proper burial, albeit a pretty sloppy one, could go to show that many of the rumors surrounding Richard are false. The team said that even though Richard has been portrayed as a villain, he was probably just an ordinary man who fought in battles and tried to do what he thought was right. The thing is that he lost. Roman Sword in Canada A Roman sword was discovered on Oak Island in Canada, and nobody knows why. Oak Island is a small piece of land just off the coast of mainland Nova Scotia shrouded in mystery. You may know it from the lost treasures and curses rumored to surround the place. Unsurprisingly, if you travel straight across the ocean, the next piece of land you hit happens to be Ireland. This is why Newfoundland, slightly above Nova Scotia, is known to have the first and only Viking settlement anywhere in the Americas. The Vikings touched down by accident, probably thanks to a current. Nobody expected a Roman weapon to be found here. It's one thing if the seafaring Vikings accidentally made it to North America, but if there were to be concrete evidence that the Romans were the first Europeans to reach the New World, well, it truly would change the history books. So how was the Roman sword discovered? It was found by two brothers just off the coast of Oak Island in what they say is a shipwreck. The ceremonial sword was allegedly taken from the wreckage. Unfortunately, it's proven hard to properly authenticate where the sword came from or how it got to Canada. It's been dated back to around the year 190 AD, and may have been a kind of ritual votive sword used by a Roman. However, it's hard to believe that an actual Roman brought it to the island. Perhaps it was brought over through trade, or placed there on purpose. In any case, unless any other Roman artifacts are found, 
it is hard to say what happened. The Early Americans A controversial new discovery in Mexico could change how we look at the history of human beings in the Americas. The way it goes in the history books is that 13,000 years ago, hunter-gatherers walked across the ice corridor that connects Asia to North America. They became the first people to ever walk on this part of the planet. These people then migrated south and spread to all corners of North America, over thousands of years developing their own distinct cultures. These people were known as the Clovis, and they were believed to be a single culture that dominated North America. But according to archaeologists affiliated with the University of Zacatecas in Mexico, people entered North America up to 33,000 years ago, almost doubling the previously accepted narrative. But how could this be possible? The archaeologists actually made a pretty good case. They studied 42 archaeological sites throughout North America and Beringia. Beringia is the area between Russia and Canada where the Bering Land Bridge once stood, and they found evidence that people have been trickling very slowly into North America for a long time. Many artifacts from many places date back further than 13,000 years, and the migration wasn't something that happened all at once, but rather over a period of at least 23,000 years. Long Lost Egyptian Queen The famous necropolis of Saqqara in Egypt is revealing more and more secrets every year. Each discovery made has the potential to change history. The Saqqara necropolis, located near the Egyptian capital of Cairo, has been the source of great discovery in the past handful of years, with more and more history-changing finds being uncovered. Most recently, archaeologists have found the abandoned temple of the Egyptian queen Nate, wife of King Teti. But why is her tomb so important? She was a long-lost queen that no one was even looking for. Until now, archaeologists didn't even know who she was. She's a new and powerful queen in the lore and history of ancient Egypt, even though historians already knew about her husband, King Teti, who was the first king of the 6th dynasty, which lasted between 2323 BC and 2150 BC. But they had no idea about his powerful wife, which is surprising given that she was also buried in a magnificent chamber. Along with dozens of mummies and coffins, archaeologists also unearthed papyrus scrolls full of what looked like spells or prayers. They were magical incantations that Egyptian priests would use to help direct the dead on their way to the afterlife. The team of archaeologists excavating the site has also found so much more. They discovered ancient games, funerary masks, statues and figurines, a miniature boat, and a total of about 54 colorfully decorated coffins. Archaeologists have only excavated 30% of the tomb so far, so there still isn't a lot of information about this mysterious woman. But in the days to come, they are sure to find out more. New Type of Human A dramatic discovery has been made in Israel regarding our ancient ancestors. The bones of a very early human, previously unknown to science, have been uncovered near the small city of Ramla. It happened just this year, 2021 with the human bones dating back about 130,000 years. There are plenty of homo species known to science, with the oldest dating back 400,000 years, and then some even more ancient species of hominin-type creatures dating back 3 million, though these aren't of the homo species. The reason this discovery is so interesting isn't because of how young the species is, but because of how weird it is. According to Science Daily, researchers believe this new type of human could replace the Neanderthal as our closest relative. And yet despite this, the creature in life looked nothing like we do. Based on its skull, it was kind of hideous. The ancient human had no chin, its eye sockets were square instead of round, and it had great big teeth completely unlike our own. Scientists have no idea what to do with this new fossil or where to put it in our confusing family tree but it's definitely going to change history. Dragon Bones The history of dragon bones in China is a curious one. In the year 1899, the chancellor of the Imperial Academy, Wang Yirong, got sick with malaria. He went to his local apothecary looking for a cure. The medicine man there sold him a very expensive and very popular remedy, dragon bones. They were said to come from real dragons and would cure his malaria if he crushed them up into powder and drank them. But Wang noticed after taking the bones home that they were covered in ancient Chinese symbols. They were very small and hard to see, but they were definitely there. He decided not to drink the bones and keep them. After he eventually got a little bit better, he went back to find out more information about the dragon bones. His investigation ended in the year 1900 when he died, probably from malaria. 
But another scholar named Luo Zhenyu finally found the source of the dragon bones nine years later, outside the small city of Enyang. There were thousands of them, and local farmers told him that the bones were often dug up by people who would sell them as fake dragon bones at apothecaries. The truth is that the bones were actually ox bones used to tell the future by ancient oracles. They were magical, just not in the way the locals thought. Archaeologists flocked to the small town of Anyang and began collecting these ancient oracle bones covered in carvings. Oracles had used the bones to try and predict the future. And to do this, they wrote the date of the question asked, the name of the person asking the question, what the question was, and the result of their prophecy. This gave historians a unique look into the past and changed the way they saw ancient Chinese society. The oracle bones are a window that allows us to look into the past as they were trying to predict the future. The Aztec Temple The remains of an ancient Aztec palace have just been discovered underneath a modern building in Mexico City. It happened during renovations in the Zocalo Plaza in the heart of Mexico City's historic district. Beneath the floor of the modern structure, researchers found a primitive stone floor that was likely part of a large palace used by an Aztec ruler. Researchers believe it also could be the mysterious palace taken over by Hernán Cortés after the fall of the Aztec Empire. There is some evidence that Cortés used some of the palace's materials to build his own home inside the ancient site after it was raised by the Spanish conquistadors. But the truth of the palace is still a bit of a mystery. We know that the ruler Ajayacat ruled from between 1469 to 1481 and was one of the very last rulers of the empire before the Spanish showed up, but we don't know how grand his palace was. Archaeologists can't actually dig out the entire area because it's covered by modern structures. The building that was being renovated is a historic pawn shop first built in 1755. As you can tell, a lot of the mysterious past of the Aztec capital, known back then as Tenochtitlan, has been erased or at least buried under the floors of shops and restaurants and other local businesses. We may never see the true scope of how huge and imposing the old Aztec palaces were. Nubian Cathedral Archaeologists have found the ruins of a huge Nubian cathedral from the medieval era in Sudan, and they don't quite know what to think of it. Archaeologists were digging in the country's north near Old Dongola. They found the destroyed bones of the largest Nubian church in the region, suggesting the ancient cathedral may have been a seat of power for the Nubian archbishops who lived during the kingdom of Makuria in the middle of the 6th century when Christianity arrived in the region and took hold. What's truly shocking is that nobody expected to find a church here. The excavations were done with the help from the Polish Center of Mediterranean Archaeology. They used special sensing techniques to look for empty spaces underneath an old citadel. They had expected to find some kind of town square, not the bones of what had once been a megalithic structure of worship. They found at least two walls of the church, each decorated with colorful paintings. They also found the ceiling of a large tomb, though they have no clue who may have been buried inside the tomb or what secrets it holds. They have yet to dig down into it, and so there could be anything hidden in the subterranean lair. It could be the final resting place of a prestigious, unknown archbishop. As for the small city itself, it prospered until the 14th century when Islam made its way into the area, along with military forces from Egypt, eventually reducing the Nubian kingdom to ashes. Empuries The Empuries archaeological site is one of the most important places in all of Europe. It's located in Spain in the province of Girona. Thousands of years ago, there were two important cities here. There was the Greek city of Emporium and the Roman city of Emporiae, and they actually existed in relative peace right beside one another. It was from here the Greeks and Romans spread their influence into what is modern-day Spain. Today, it's the only archaeological site in the region where you can find settlements built by Greece and Rome in close proximity. But there's a lot of mystery here, too. The Greeks built their city in the 6th century BC as a commercial settlement, and the Romans built theirs in the 1st century BC, about 500 years later. The two cities prospered from trade and never fought with one another. However, it was in the 3rd century AD that the region was abandoned. People from both cities picked up and walked away, and over time their great structures, palaces, and monuments were lost. 
To this day, archaeologists can't pinpoint a reason why this happened. The only structures remaining are degraded beyond repair, nothing more than loose bricks and crumbling mud walls. But more clues could come with more excavations. Only around 25% of the region has been uncovered so far. Archaeologists are still digging, with many experts convinced there is some kind of treasure buried here just waiting to be found. China's Ancient City There is no ancient place in China more mysterious than San Qingzhui. It was only discovered about a few decades ago and still has historians scratching their heads when they try to figure out who lived here, where they came from, and where they went. Archaeological evidence has shown that the mysterious city dates back 3,000 years. Still, the origins of this city remain unknown. The first discovery was made here in the 1980s, when researchers found two pits filled with elephant tusks, mysterious golden masks, bronze figures that resemble alien visitors with bulging eyes and weird features, and other strange artifacts unlike any other relics found in China. This is pretty cool because China is huge. Yet despite China's size, this is the only place where the weird alien figurines have been found. Since the 80s, thousands of more artifacts have been uncovered. Huge buildings, a massive city wall that protected the capital of the mysterious civilization from attack, and even sacrificial pits likely used in strange rituals. To give you an idea of the timeline, this city flourished as a technologically advanced capital back when the boy pharaoh Tutankhamun was being lowered into a tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Another truly strange thing about this ancient city is that they left behind no written materials. Despite their advancements in building technology, they had no written system. A lot of theories place the people here as being influenced by extraterrestrials, especially because of the strange figurines found all over the site. Experts would like you to just appreciate this mysterious culture, no aliens needed. The Unicorn Cave There is a mysterious place in Germany called the Unicorn Cave. No, it's not home to a mythical race of unicorns. Instead, it was the recent site for one of the most important Neanderthal discoveries in history. The Unicorn Cave is in the Harz Mountains. The cave was likely used by our Neanderthal ancestors as a place of shelter for tens of thousands of years. During all that time as cave people, they learned how to do something that has shocked scientists to their core. This shocking discovery came in the form of a bone, a toe bone from a deer to be exact. The toe bone has been dated back 51,000 years. This was right around the time that Neanderthals went extinct. They lived from between roughly 400,000 to 45,000 years before today, at which point they began being replaced by real humans. The toe bone was so fascinating because it was found with curious patterns carved on it. This has proven to be the earliest example of a humanoid creature creating artwork on purpose. Scientists say a Neanderthal picked up the bone, carved geometric symbols into it, and then probably kept it as some kind of symbolic treasure. Nobody knows what the symbols mean, or rather what they meant to the Neanderthals. Until now, nobody even believed that Neanderthals could create art. We thought these were advanced, monkey-like, human things that made grunting sounds and clacked stone tools together. Now it seems that Neanderthals actually had a creative side, one that seems to have been born inside the unicorn cave. How and why is a question that scientists don't have an answer for. Castle Rig Stone Circle The Castle Rig Stone Circle is a mysterious place in Britain that rivals Stonehenge in its mystique and wonder. There are plenty of weird stone circles in Britain that scientists can't figure out, but Castle Rig is unique. It's in one of the most dramatic settings overlooking the vast Thirlmere Valley, with sprawling mountains rising in the distance. According to English Heritage, the stone circle is about 5,000 years old, constructed back in 3000 BC. This makes it perhaps the earliest in all of England. This is an important title when there are at least 300 stone circles from the Bronze Age scattered throughout Britain. The oldest should arguably be the most important. But just what is this stone circle and who were its builders? What kind of mysteries did they leave behind? Castle Rig is an open circle about 100 feet in diameter and built of 42 stones. These stones are up to 7.5 feet in height. It's been suggested that the stone circle was used to track the planets and the stars, so that's never been confirmed. Despite all the stone circles in Britain, there has never been a consistent orientation to them all. 
They may have been used to watch the stars, or places like Castlerigg may have been used to sacrifice humans to long-lost gods. Historians and scientists are barely starting to scratch the surface of this mysterious stone circle. Want to give a big shout out to the Kennedy family and Randall Petrolji. Thanks so much for supporting this channel. If you want to learn more, be sure to hit that subscribe button and join the Origins Explained family. Mysterious Byzantine Church The Basilica San Vitale in Italy was under construction when the Byzantine Emperor Justinian conquered the nation in the 6th century. Justinian continued to build the amazing church, which became a testament to himself and to the glory of Jesus. Today, the Basilica San Vitale is the only church from the Byzantine era still perfectly intact. It's still one of the most impressive churches anywhere in Italy, and is decorated in gorgeous mosaics from the Byzantine Empire. From the outside, the basilica is so fascinating that it's hard to believe such a place exists. Inside, the mosaics are extraordinary. Because the Emperor Justinian continued to build the basilica after taking over Italy, he was able to incorporate himself and his wife, Theodora, into the artwork, depicting them as divine rulers, when they kind of weren't. One of the most mysterious aspects of the Byzantine church is who exactly it was dedicated to. Almost nothing is known of the life of Saint Vitalis. One story says he was born in Milan and then buried while still breathing in Ravenna. Another story says he was tortured before being buried alive. It's also rumored that his wife and children were killed as martyrs. However, the actual site of the church may have been the execution grounds of yet another martyr, San Vitalis of Bologna. Back in those days, there were so many saints and so many martyrs that today, it's honestly a little hard for historians to keep track. Unknown Himalayan Civilization Scientists have recently made an incredible discovery in India that might change history. A joint expedition between scientists from Russia and India found two ritual structures deep in the Himalayan province, suggesting a mysterious unknown civilization once lived among the snowy peaks of the Himalayas in total secrecy. According to the deputy director of the Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography, who has been working closely with the project, the ritual complexes were found in a highly elevated place within the mountains where almost nobody goes. This is why archaeologists never came across the bizarre sites before. At least 200 strange horsemen statues were found scattered throughout the sanctuaries. What's kind of weird is that the horse statues have anywhere between one and four riders on them, which honestly makes no sense. Four people shouldn't be riding on a single horse. So what were these sculptures supposed to represent? The sculptures are richly decorated and were obviously handmade by people who knew what they were doing. But this is way up in the Himalayas. It's very cold and hardly anybody goes here. How did a culture flourish without anyone knowing? Scientists believe that the horse carvings, along with the ruins of the ritual buildings, were part of a civilization that nobody even has a name for yet. Where they went or even when they lived in the area is a total mystery. Lake Michigan Stonehenge In 2007, a stone circle that looks awfully similar to Stonehenge was discovered on the bottom of Lake Michigan, and nobody can confirm how it got there. The discovery is thanks to Mark Hawley, a professor of underwater archaeology who went on an expedition to the bottom of Lake Michigan and couldn't believe his eyes when he found standing stones arranged in a circle along with carvings of what looked to be an extinct mastodon. This is shocking for several reasons. The most obvious is that mastodons went extinct 10,000 years before today. That means that whoever erected the stone circle and made the carvings would have lived before that, at a time when huge beasts still roamed across North America, probably during the last ice age. In other words, if proven to be real, the carvings are direct evidence that humans lived alongside mastodons in what is today Michigan, and that they somehow built an underwater Stonehenge for unknown reasons. Although that long ago, the place was most likely on dry land. Unfortunately, wild archaeological discoveries like this frequently get buried under doubt and speculation. Nobody wants to change the official historical narrative, which is why a lot of scientists have come out to say that the rocks probably weren't arranged by human hands, saying they just kind of fell into a circle on their own and that the Mastodon carvings might be the archaeologists' imagination. However, further expeditions could reveal the truth. It is not that unlikely that long ago, ancient people would have made standing stones since these structures are found all over the world. However, its purpose, who built it, and why 
are all still mysteries yet to be solved. Hole in the Sphinx The Sphinx in Egypt is one of the most mysterious places in the world, and it just keeps getting more and more intriguing. There is apparently a secret chamber hidden beneath the body of the Great Sphinx of Giza that could lead to an undiscovered treasure hoard. This theory has been around for centuries. It's nothing new. Everyone knows there's a doorway at the bottom of the Sphinx. It's been there for 4,500 years. However, it's never really been confirmed what the hole at the bottom was meant for, other than to lead down into some creepy chambers. Now, historian Dr. Bethany Hughes claims the empty chamber at the bottom of the Sphinx leads to more chambers, these ones not so empty. The issue with finding the treasure is that the only way to do so would be to excavate inside the Sphinx. This would involve blasting a hole deeper beneath the monument to get into the underground tunnels and chambers. One mistake could collapse the entire Sphinx, ruining the iconic monument. It's believed that the chambers were sealed so effectively back in the days of Pharaoh Khufu that there is no way to see their entrances. The only way to get in is by force, which the Egyptian government is definitely not going to allow. Scientists are hoping to scan the Sphinx to perhaps find another entrance, or at least be able to take a look inside in search of the hidden chambers, which may hold lost treasures and hidden mummies. The World's First Smiley Face The first smiley face in the entire world has just been put on exhibit in Turkey at the Gaziantep Archaeology Museum. The smiley face that we know and love actually goes back 3,700 years. You can think of it as the first emoji ever. The face was discovered inscribed on an ancient jug in the city of Karkemish. This old and forgotten city was the capital of the mysterious Hittite civilization. Apparently, they were making smiley faces before anyone else. The excavation team was led by Professor Nicolo Marchetti, who was in the city for seven years searching for artifacts and trying to gain better insight into who the Hittites were. The archaeologists found plenty of interesting artifacts over the years, but the smiley face was by far the best. But why was the smiley face emoji inscribed on the side of an ancient jug in the first place? That remains a mystery that archaeologists will probably never solve. The jug was actually found in fragments and had to be pieced back together, and researchers were shocked when they saw the two dots and the semicircle making up the smiley face. It's the first one in human history, but nobody knows what could have motivated the artist. Perhaps someone just wanted to add some cheer to someone else's day by drawing them a smile. The First Artists Who was the first artist in the history of humanity? Well, you might be interested to know that the oldest cave art paintings in the world were actually completed by women, making cave ladies the first artists ever. This information comes from the new analysis of a series of ancient handprints. Up until now, researchers have assumed the ancient artists who scrawled pictures on cave walls and cliff faces using crushed plants and ore for color were men. However, this proved to be a totally baseless hypothesis founded on literally no information other than assuming that cave artists were men. Dean Snow from Pennsylvania State University worked with a team of archaeologists to analyze hand stencils taken from eight separate caves found throughout Europe. By comparing the length of the fingers and the hand stencils, Snow and his team figured out that three quarters of them were female. Snow himself said to the National Geographic Society's Committee for Research and Exploration that there has been a male bias in the field for quite some time. You just assume men when talking about much of history, but now some things are starting to make sense. Men were typically hunters and physically stronger, so they would track, chase, and kill everything from bison to reindeer and even woolly mammoths. However, as always, men don't live in a vacuum and men and women have lived together forever, so women were just as concerned with the hunting as the men, as this was for the good of everyone's survival. So it's no surprise that they were the ones who drew so many pictures of hunts and hands on cave walls in support and perhaps prayer. The first city in the New World The first city in the New World was a place called Caral, located in modern-day Peru. 5,000 years ago in the Americas, a huge urban center flourished as the capital of the ancient world. In its prime, the city of Caral had 150 acres of pyramids, sprawling plazas, and residential suburbs. It was a thriving metropolis that was already functioning as a complex society when the Egyptians were messing around trying to build their own pyramids. The city here was first discovered in 1905. 
Back then, nobody paid much attention because they thought the ruins were too recent. When excavations began in earnest in the late 1990s, archaeologists realized there was much more going on here than just some recently destroyed structures. But how and why Caral came to be the first major city is a bit of a mystery. It predates the Olmec settlements found in Central America by 1,000 years. Archaeologist Ruth Shady Solis from Peru has been trying to understand why the people moved from the more hospitable coast, where fishing was abundant, to what is basically the middle of the desert to form the first mega city. She believes it comes down to trade. Based on archaeological evidence from all throughout South America found in the city of Caral, such as exotic fruit from the rainforest and snails and seeds from other parts of the region, Shady says the city grew and prospered because of trade. The people at Caral were able to become rich, have their needs met, build massive structures, and were able to sustain themselves for thousands of years by becoming the main trading hub in South America. The first mummy. The first mummy in the world was not made where you think. Instead, the first corpse to be wrapped in bandages and preserved through the process of mummification came from South America, near what is today the border of southern Peru and northern Chile. The people who made the first mummy are known as the Chinchorro culture and may date back over 7,000 years. The oldest mummy ever discovered was a person who died in the year 5050 BC. To give a rough comparison, that's 2,000 years before the first Egyptian mummy. Even more amazing is that the Chinchorro people actually created mummies by accident several thousand years earlier. By simply burying their dead in a very dry environment in the desert, their dead loved ones naturally turned into mummies all on their own 9,000 years ago. The Chinchorro lived in one of the driest places on Earth. Some areas of the desert here haven't seen rain in over 400 years. So how was the first legit mummy made? It's oddly similar to how Egyptians made their mummies. The first step was to remove the organs. The brain, heart, and all the gushy stuff inside the body was taken out. Next, the hair and skin were scraped off using a primitive stone tool, or sometimes a knife made from a pelican's beak. Next, they would remove the appendages, sometimes decapitating and dismembering the dead person and drying out all their limbs before stitching them back together. The body was then dried using smoke from hot coals from a fire. And lastly, the dried remains were filled with straw and feathers, the skin was covered in clay, the body would be painted in black or red, and then it was stuffed into the ground to be buried and preserved for eternity. The first bone tools. Archaeologists have recently discovered the earliest known bone tools anywhere in Europe. These tools come from the Boxgrove archaeological site in Sussex, England. These ancient implements were made out of the bones of a horse that was butchered by ancient humans for its meat. Archaeologists found flakes of stone piled up around the dead animal, suggesting a group of about eight people were cutting it apart with flint knives. Archaeologists also found evidence that other people had been present during the carving, which has led them to believe the butchering of the horse was part of a group activity. Everyone came together to divide the horse up like a pig roast party or a luau. But there wasn't just a single stone tool found here. Archaeologists uncovered hundreds of them, along with plenty of animal bones, all of it dating back 500,000 years. That's right, these tools are half a million years old, the absolute oldest ever found in Europe. They were crafted by a race of hominids known as Homo heidelbergensis, who are not only our ancient ancestors, but also the ancient ancestors of our other ancient ancestors, the Neanderthals. According to Dr. Matthew Pope, the archaeologist in charge of the dig, the discovery was as close as we have ever gotten to witnessing the play-by-play -play movements of such an ancient group of early humans working together in a very social way. Also, the researchers managed to reconstruct the exact kind of tools that were used. The tools were extremely basic and carved from the horse bones, as well as some knives made of flint and some hammers made from rock. Want to give a big shout out to Matthew McNeil and Lynn Durbin. Thanks so much for supporting this channel. If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button and join us. The first fire. In one of the most shocking discoveries of our time, researchers believe they finally found the first fire. This has been a burning question for thousands of years, no pun intended. Anthropologists have debated when and where human beings figured out how to create fire whenever they wanted. This was the defining moment which separated our ancient ancestors from the kingdom of beasts. Because before fire, 
humans were basically just really hairy people hiding in the dark and being eaten by lions. To understand the development of fire, let's take a look at how fire is made. There are three ingredients, fuel, oxygen, and combustion. The biggest issue for ancient humans would have been combustion. The only way a fire would have started on Earth before us was lightning strikes and other weather phenomenon, or maybe lava from a volcano. So how did humans get the jump on it? The oldest fire that we know of created naturally was 420 million years ago, identified because of charcoal and rocks. But it wasn't until 345 million years ago, during the early Carboniferous period, that the first wildfire ravaged the world thanks to a high level of atmospheric oxygen. In Israel, inside the Kesem Cave, archaeologists found the earliest evidence of humans making fire. This is the first place in the world where archaeologists have found evidence of a single hearth being repeatedly used. They found evidence that flint was used to start a fire in the same spot over and over, based on leftover scraps of stone and the charred ground dating back 400,000 years ago. However, it wouldn't be until 40,000 years ago that humans all over the world finally had a grip on the stuff. The First Queen 4,500 years ago, a woman rose to power, becoming the first documented queen in history. Known as Queen Kubaba, she is on the King List, an ancient chronicle of rulers from Mesopotamia, and she is referred to as King, not King Consort, which means that she ruled in her own right and was not simply married to the king. Next to her name, the epithet reads, The Woman Tavern Keeper Who Made Firm the Foundations of Kish. Sumer is the first known civilization in the world. It had plenty of powerful kings. In the ancient Mesopotamian city of Kish, Kubaba brewed and sold beer. But she wasn't just a tavern keeper. Back in those days, people who brewed and sold beer were well respected, and sometimes even nobility. Beer was sacred, used in rituals and ceremonies. You can think of her as a successful businesswoman who rose through the ranks to seize the throne for herself. According to an ancient text, Kubaba started a campaign to feed men bread and water, and in exchange they were to make offerings to the gods. The main god, Marduk, appreciated this and smiled upon her, making her queen. Bread and water were used to make beer in those times, which was a gift from the gods. The tablet says that she ruled for 100 years, although it's hard to know when she ruled for sure. 1,000 years later, she was honored as a goddess by the Hittites, and her legacy outlasted the fall of Sumer and the Hittites. Historians believe she later transformed into the Greco-Roman goddess Cybele, mother of the gods and honored for thousands of years more. The first beer. Who invented beer? Every beer enthusiast in the world would love to know the answer. Unfortunately, it's a little complicated. Historians say the first fermented beverages appeared along with the development of agriculture about 12,000 years ago. At the time that civilizations began settling and farming, producing crops like rice and barley, they accidentally stumbled upon the process of fermentation. This resulted in the brewing of beer. Let's check out the earliest alcoholic beverage known to scientists. It actually comes from China, 9,000 years ago. Archaeologists discovered a concoction crafted from honey, fruit, and rice, which turned out to be a very old type of wine. However, People were definitely drinking alcohol earlier than that. The issue is finding hard evidence. The earliest solid proof of beer production in the ancient world goes back to the Sumerians about 5,000 years ago. Remember, Kubaba, tavern keeper turned queen. Archaeologists discovered ceramic vessels from the year 3400 BC that were still sticky with leftover beer residue. Basically, beer has been around for as long as civilization. The first battle. There have been plenty of battles throughout history, but the first battle that was ever recorded in detail went down in 1468 BC. Prior to this, there had undoubtedly been skirmishes and wars. This wasn't the first time people fought to the death, but it was the first battle that we can look at with historical clarity because it was transcribed in striking detail. This is the Battle of Megiddo, and it went down after the death of the legendary Queen Hatshepsut. After her death, the pharaoh Thutmose III rose to the throne, and the angry kings of Megiddo rose up in rebellion. The kings gathered the largest army that was ever seen on the face of the planet up to that point, roughly 20,000 men and 1,000 war chariots. But they were fighting against the pharaoh of Egypt, not an easy task back then. 
the pharaoh assembled a similar army, including Nubians, Egyptians, and specialists with the new composite bow. They marched all the way to Megiddo and overwhelmed the opposing forces. The pharaoh and his army had such a definitive victory at first that had they pushed the attack and rushed the city, they would have easily wiped out the rebel kings and taken over the territory. However, instead of pushing the attack, the soldiers stopped fighting to pillage all the dead bodies at the rebel camp. In the end, Tutmos III was victorious anyway. He taught the rebels a valuable lesson not to mess with Egypt. But if his soldiers had just behaved themselves and not been obsessed with robbing everyone, he could have taken the city and expanded the Egyptian empire. Kind of a missed opportunity. The first animal. What was the first ever true animal on earth? The answer might surprise you. The first animal in the world was actually a comb jelly, not a sponge as originally thought. This surprised scientists because nobody had thought that the first living being to appear on our planet would be so complicated. The study to discover the first animal was done by researchers with Brown University in Rhode Island, who described the result as a complete shocker. Scientists had previously believed the first animal on Earth was a sea sponge. However, by assessing massive volumes of data and tracing the evolutionary relationships between species all the way to the first branch on the evolutionary tree, they reached the conclusion that the comb jellyfish was the first animal on Earth. According to Live Science, at first the scientists thought they were wrong. The team checked and rechecked their results and came up with the same result every time. The comb jelly came first. Unlike sponges, comb jellies have connective tissues and a nervous system, and so they are more complex. It probably looked a bit different than it does today. It was still a squishy jellyfish with connective tissue and a nervous system. It just wasn't a true jellyfish because it didn't have cells for stinging or the traditional bell-shaped body. It still doesn't. Scientists don't know exactly how long the comb jelly has been around, but they know it goes back at least half a billion years. Baldwin IV of Jerusalem Medieval Prince Baldwin IV was nine years old when he was diagnosed with leprosy. At that time, the disease was a death sentence, and victims were shunned by the community, usually to die a slow death alone. Born in 1161, he was the son of the French Christian king Amalric I of Jerusalem, and so his family protected him and kept him at the palace. When Baldwin IV was just 13 years old, his father died, making him king of Jerusalem. At the time, the French had taken over Jerusalem from the Muslims 75 years before during the First Crusade. The Muslims, led by legendary leader Sultan Saladin, took advantage of this transition and decided to attack. There was no way this sickly young king could maintain order. The Sultan already reigned over Egypt and Syria and wanted to once again reign over the holy city of Jerusalem. Despite his illness and youth, Baldwin IV was by all accounts extremely clever and an excellent horseback rider even though he could not use one arm. The same year he became king, he launched a successful attack on Damascus to draw Saladin's army away from the famous city of Aleppo. In just two years, the leper king continued to harass and attack the sultan, keeping him away from the Holy Land, making him furious. In 1177, Sultan Saladin led 26,000 men to attack the city of Ashkelon. Baldwin and his army were vastly outnumbered, which is 4,500 men. But when the armies collided, the Muslims were crushed and forced to retreat. The Franks chased them down for 12 miles, and the sultan barely escaped with his life. King Baldwin was just 16 years old at the time. Known as the Battle of Montgisard, this victory made King Baldwin a hero and beloved by his people. He died at the age of 24 and was succeeded by his nephew. In the movie Kingdom of Heaven, King Baldwin IV is played by Edward Norton. Have you seen this movie? Do you recommend it? Let me know in the comments below. Ptolemy XIII Theos Philopator Ptolemy XIII is the lesser-known boy king of ancient Egypt. He was born in the year 62 BC and became pharaoh 11 years later. He had a pretty miserable time of it. First of all, his sister was Cleopatra VII, and they were co-rulers together. But this family you know was extremely ambitious. Cleopatra was 18 years old, and sharing power with her 11-year-old brother-slash-husband? No thank you. Just try to imagine being an 18-year-old girl and ruling all of Egypt with your annoying little brother. Cleopatra must have really hated it but she didn't have to deal with it for long. It was a strange time in both Roman and Egyptian history. The ruling class of Egyptians feared Cleopatra because of her ambition and power, and the young pharaoh was the only thing stopping her from taking over the country. 
Within Egypt and the palace, there were various factions, all trying to gain power and control. There were Cleopatra supporters and Ptolemies. But then, at the same time, there was a civil war going on in Rome between Julius Caesar and the Roman statesman Pompey. Young Pharaoh Ptolemy wished to make an alliance with Caesar because he seemed more powerful, and so he brutally killed Pompey, Caesar's rival. When Caesar arrived in Alexandria, the pharaoh sent Caesar the head of his enemy, but Caesar didn't like that at all. Sometime during all of this craziness, Cleopatra snuck into the palace at Alexandria to seduce Julius Caesar, and the rest of the story is history. In the end, Ptolemy went to war against Julius Caesar and his sister Cleopatra, but was defeated in 47 BC at the Battle of the Nile. While trying to escape the vicious Roman dictator, the poor boy king was attacked and drowned. He died at the age of only 15. Caesar then took complete control of Egypt and reinstated the dead pharaoh's sister, Cleopatra, as his co-ruler. Ivan the Terrible Ivan IV, better known as Ivan the Terrible, was known for his cruelty and violence. He was also the first Tsar of Russia after his father and grandfather fought to unify Russian lands and protect it from outside invaders such as the Ottomans and the Mongols. Born in 1530, at the young age of three, his father died due to an abscess on his leg that gave him blood poisoning. His mother was technically queen regent, but was assassinated five years later, leaving Ivan a young boy at the mercy of other nobles and their political interests. The aristocracy was all about getting power for themselves and did not really want a king to rule over them. It is said that instead of educating Ivan and preparing him to rule, they would beat him and lock him up in solitary confinement for days at a time. He was weak and scrawny, probably from malnutrition, and it was most likely during this time that he learned what he needed to do to survive no matter what the cost. He lived in constant fear and this must have influenced his ruthless and suspicious nature. Somehow he was able to make alliances with the nobles, and when Ivan turned 16, he was officially crowned Tsar of Russia. He united Russia, which previously had been nothing more than a lot of loosely connected medieval states. He also expanded the borders and paved the way for the monarchy to have absolute power in the following centuries, forcefully taking land and giving it to his supporters. And he did all of this at a very young age. Before Ivan, Russia was kind of a hermit kingdom. He opened the nation to international trade and even began correspondence with England. He conquered the Tartar to the south and annexed the Volga region. Over time, he was more prone to mental instability but he had so much power, the nobles were forced to accept his every demand. They couldn't do anything without him. And so he began torturing, killing, exiling, and destroying everyone who had ever been mean to him, including their children and grandchildren, so they would feel his wrath. After all, they had tortured him as a child, poisoned his mother, and most likely his wife. He controlled the military, the treasury, and administered the courts. He also set up a secret police that had free reign to crush his enemies at home and abroad. During the end of his reign, he became violent with his family, beating them in fits of rage, killing his own children and grandchildren. His reign of terror only got worse, leaving the country in chaos when he died. King Oyo of Turo The youngest king in modern times is King Oyo of Turo from Uganda. Kingdoms were outlawed back in 1967 by the Ugandan government, but reinstated in the 1990s under conditions that the leaders of the individual kingdoms did not have conflict with one another and instead focused on culture. Five years later, in 1995, King Oyo ascended to the throne at the age of three. He has been in power ever since, ruling over two million people. It's a strange time to be a boy king. In 2021, King Oyo has access to all of the technologies of the modern world, while at the same time ruling a pre-colonial kingdom. He has subjects kissing his feet, he has a throne decorated in leopard skin, and wears robes of blue and gold. And of course, he also wears a crown. What kind of decisions can a teenager make to impact his kingdom in this day and age? He mostly makes decisions regarding spending, such as how tax money is spent, which projects to support for health and education, and other building and infrastructure projects. Mary, Queen of Scots Mary, Queen of Scots, was born in 1542. One week later, her father died, making her Queen of Scotland at only six days old. When she came of age, Mary was supposed to marry King Henry VIII's son, Prince Edward of England. But the Scots refused the agreement after centuries of fighting. King Henry was so angry that he started a war between Scotland and England. During the war, Mary was sent to France to marry the French Prince Francis II in an attempt to secure an alliance with the Catholics against the Protestant English. 
She was 15 and he was 14, but weak and sickly. She lived at the French court and the Scots and the French signed agreements that would unite under one kingdom. When the king died, Mary became queen, but then her young husband died and she was forced to return to Scotland as a young widow. What followed were many years of danger, since she was a direct threat to the Protestant English throne. Many supported her since she was Catholic, and England was in the throes of civil war since Henry VIII had decided to change religions. Her life was full of betrayals, assassinations, and some romance. Mary's last husband was the Earl of Bothwell, who was actually accused of murdering Mary's previous husband, Lord Darnley. Her marriage to the Earl of Bothwell was not well received, and Mary was imprisoned in a castle and forced to give birth there. The twins she birthed did not survive. As for Bothwell, he fled the country and died. Mary escaped from house arrest, gathered a small army, and was promptly defeated. After the death of King Henry VIII, Queen Elizabeth I of England tried to avoid the situation with Mary, but in the end, she was too much of a threat and was executed. And now for one of the most famous pharaohs of all. But first, I wanted to give a big shout out to Thomas Jones, who watches every day, and Skills Killer One and Fiance. Congratulations, you two! If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button and join the Origins Explained family. Tutankhamun Boy Pharaoh Tutankhamun was the original boy pharaoh of Egypt. He was the 12th pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, son of Akhenaten, the heretic king. King Tut's father threw all of Egyptian society into chaos after he abruptly forbade the worship of the Egyptian gods and told everyone they could only worship the god he liked the most. Aten, the sun disk. It was absolute pandemonium. After the king's death, his young son rose to the seat of power at the age of only nine, and as is custom in ancient Egypt, he married his half-sister. The first thing Tutankhamun did as ruler was to restore order to the kingdom. He let everyone go back to believing in the old gods, specifically restoring the sacred shrines of Amun. Unfortunately for everyone, not many records of his life exist. Historians also aren't 100% sure how he died. At the age of 18, he was entombed in the Valley of the Kings, not uncovered for another 3,000 years until 1922. He is now the most famous pharaoh to have ever lived, and the discovery of his tomb is one of the greatest finds of the modern world. Alfonso XIII of Spain Alfonso XIII was born in Madrid in 1886. He ascended the throne as king when he was just a baby. King Alfonso XII had died, leaving his wife, Queen Maria Cristina of Austria, as regent. She was dedicated to making Alfonso strong and physically fit. He spent his days swimming, riding, and sailing. And by the time Alfonso was ready to begin making decisions as the King of Spain, when he was crowned at the age of 16, he was a pretty beefy guy. It was not a good time for Spain. They had recently lost Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the Philippines during the Spanish-American War. The colonial rule of the Americas was officially over. Spain was in great turmoil as a country. A huge Spanish force was annihilated in Morocco in 1923, and the Spanish government was taken over by a military dictatorship which Alfonso supported. But the dictatorship came to an end just seven years later, and Alfonso was disgraced by his association with them. It became so hard for him in Spain that he had to leave the country to avoid a civil war. He settled in Rome, and in 1931, Spain became a republic. A civil war ensued anyway in 1936, but Alfonso stayed hiding abroad. He spent most of his life in exile and died in 1941. Queen Christina of Sweden Queen Christina of Sweden was crowned in 1632 at the age of six, after her father, King Gustavus Adolphus Vasa, was killed in battle. Her mother was so distraught at the death of the king and the fact that Christina was a girl and not a boy that she was excluded from being the queen regent. When Christina was a baby, there were several suspicious accidents involving her mother. Before his death, the king had ordered for Christina to be raised and educated as a boy, which was honored by the nobles at court. Christina was known for being a rather unorthodox queen. She ended the Thirty Years' War to finally bring peace, which was a pretty big accomplishment. She started a court of learning to promote art and philosophy, bringing educated people from all over the world, including Rene Descartes. Stockholm became known as the Athens of the North. She was ridiculed for being an extremely well-educated woman and for having an unusual interest in the arts. There were also rumors that she didn't like men and was more interested in the ladies, although it's probably likely she enjoyed ruling alone. However, there are many passionate love letters she wrote to both men and women that have been found, 
but historians do not know for sure about her sexuality. She occasionally dressed in men's clothing and surprisingly converted from Lutheranism to Roman Catholicism. Due to pressures from the court and problems with taxation and governance in general, Queen Christina had some sort of a breakdown and decided to abdicate the throne. She left Sweden and moved to Rome, where she became a favorite in the Vatican and became involved in religious politics. She tried and failed to become the queen of several places, including Naples and Poland. She challenged what it meant to be a woman during that time and has left behind many letters and journals that are helping historians understand who she was. Puyi, the last emperor of China. Puyi was the last emperor of China and led a pretty interesting life. He was the only emperor that was ever put on the throne three times, despite never being in true power. At the age of just two, he was brought to the Forbidden City, the great imperial palace in the heart of Beijing, and was made to secede the dying emperor who had no heirs. He was chosen by Empress Dowager Sichi because she knew that she would still be able to rule behind the young boy. His first reign lasted from between 1908 to 1912. He was kicked off the throne for five years and then given his power back by the warlord Cheng Chun. This restored the quickly deteriorating Qing dynasty for about 12 days before he was kicked off the throne again. Then, between 1934 and 1945, during World War II, Puyi was made ruler of Manchukuo as a puppet of the Empire of Japan. Even though he ruled China three times technically, he was never really in charge of anything throughout his entire life, which is probably how he managed to stay alive. Puyi was also the end of Imperial China. After 2,133 years of history, Puyi marked the very end of China's imperial chapter when he was banished as ruler in 1912, and the power was handed over to the Republican Army. This was a very interesting time in history, as Puyi also happened to be the first Chinese emperor that ever spoke English. Between 1917 and 1934, he even took the English name Henry, given to him by his Scottish teacher. Plus, he was the first emperor that ever wore a suit. After the People's Republic of China was established in 1949, he spent 10 years in prison as a war criminal before finally being released and living the last eight years of his life in modern times as a completely ordinary citizen. The last emperor of China sold tickets at the Beijing Botanical Gardens in the 1960s and died in 1967. Jetsun Pema Wangchuk, Dragon Queen Jetsun Pema Wangchuk is the Dragon Queen of the Kingdom of Bhutan. For those who don't know, Bhutan is a very small nation in Asia that has very little contact with the outside world. You can't even go here as a tourist without getting permission and paying for a special guide who follows you along your journey. Bhutan translates in the local language as the land of the thunder dragon. Bhutanese people call themselves the dragon people, and their ruler is the dragon queen. Well, she is not the ruler, but she is married to him. As of right now, she is the youngest queen anywhere in the world. She became the Dragon Queen at the age of 21. Jetson Pema is an environmental advocate and works closely with children who have special needs. Perhaps she doesn't have such dramatic queenly duties as some of the other young rulers from the past, though she is heavily involved in a handful of very important foundations that help the less fortunate. She is even the president of the Bhutan Red Cross Society and is doing her best to improve people's lives. Murad IV, the Sultan. Murad IV is considered one of the mightiest sultans in the history of the Ottoman Empire. He came to the throne at the age of just 11. This was a time when the Ottoman Empire was crumbling under corruption. Government officials were being executed, the treasury was drained, and there was great lawlessness throughout the empire. Murad was born in Constantinople and ruled from 1603 until 1617, dying at the age of 27. However, he did get a lot done, and he ended many lives. As a young boy, Murad IV took his duties as sultan very seriously. He implemented strict rules, some of which included the banishment of alcohol, coffee, and tobacco. According to historians, he was a big drinker, but for everyone else, it was strictly forbidden. He executed anyone suspected of breaking these rules, and was the first sultan to ever execute a Muslim dignitary. He was very cruel and executed people on impulse, anyone who he didn't like, especially women, if they refused him. He famously recaptured Baghdad and had several victories during wartime. He began construction of the Blue Mosque, still one of the most famous mosques in Turkey, and he got rid of the crazy law in which Ottomans who became sultans executed their brothers. He tried to bring order and stability, but as soon as he died, everything once again fell apart. 
His young and mentally disturbed brother, Mustafa I, was put on the throne in 1617 and ruled for a single year, until a palace faction helped support his other brother, Osman II, to take the throne. But then Osman II was killed, and Mustafa took the throne back in 1622. Thanks for watching! Which ruler are you most fascinated by? Let me know in the comments below, and remember to subscribe if you haven't already! See you next time! Bye!